Hello and welcome to my channel, Vice Rhino here. Today I'm looking at a video by Impact Video Ministries. This one is part of their Evidence for God's Existence series, which seems to be a single video as far as I can tell. So let's see what sort of evidence they have. Now a lot of times Christians can be asked the question, how do you know God exists? Which is a good question, I mean, we can't see God, we can't hear his voice, and I couldn't introduce you to him. Yep, that's right. The all-powerful creator of the universe wants to have a personal relationship with you. He just doesn't want to do any of the personal stuff himself. That's all on you. God is like Captain Tuttle from that one episode of MASH. Captain Tuttle was Hawkeye's childhood imaginary friend whose name he would use for doing anonymous work. Through the episode, Everyone became convinced that they were good friends with Captain Tuttle, despite never having met him. God is Captain Tuttle. So how can you believe in something that you can't see? A lot of people can say, you can't prove God exists, which is true in a sense, but just because Christians can't give you direct evidence for God's existence, we still have strong reasons to believe that there is a God. We have strong reasons to believe that there is a God. There's just no evidence for him, and there's no way we can adequately demonstrate his existence. Okay, video over. No evidence for God. Boom. Done. So in our next series, we will be responding to the following statement, you can't prove God exists. Just please don't respond with, oh yeah, well you can't prove he doesn't exist, because that's just silly. One reason why people don't believe in God is because they believe in science! We live in an age of science and all those religious fanatics need to get with the times! Okay, standard disclaimer about the existence of religious scientists who were able to do good scientific work despite their religious beliefs, Francis Collins, yada yada yada, but looking specifically at Impact Video Ministries, they are a young earth creationist organization. I've covered their videos where they try to deny the science of evolution in favor of their fundamentalist religious beliefs. It is possible to accept science science and still be religious, but creationists don't do that. They actively reject well-established science in favor of unfalsifiable magical claims. Many times people can make the assumption that people who believe in God only believe in God out of blind faith. Well, the Bible tells you to walk by faith and not by sight, and there are a bunch of worship songs that have been written along those lines, enough that I can't even find the one that I'm most familiar with to reference here because there's just too many other ones to weed through. So here's the old Catholic hymn that is all about how much faith we have in God despite God not ever giving us any evidence of his existence, as though that's a good thing for him to have done. And as much as apologists like to equate faith with trust, the Bible defines faith as the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen, nothing about having evidence for anything. So since the Bible literally tells you to believe in God on blind faith, and there are a plethora of worship songs about how much believers enjoy doing just that, and there are zero worship songs telling you to be more like Doubting Thomas, I'm just going to go ahead and take the Bible's word over yours that blind faith really is what drives a belief in God. Just believe! Ignore the science and commit intellectual suicide and believe in God already! The only parts of the Bible that I have seen that could be interpreted as believing things that are demonstrated by evidence are stories like Doubting Thomas, where the seeking of confirmation is shown in a rather negative light, with the final word in the matter being, blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. Or on the flip side, there's the story of the prophets of Baal challenging Elijah to a god-off, where the people don't believe either the prophets of Baal or Elijah until both Baal and Yahweh have an opportunity to make a demonstration. Baal fails, Elijah suggests that Baal might be too busy taking a dump to answer their prayers, and then Yahweh wins and all the people proclaim that God is God, and then the prophets of Baal are all slaughtered. That story actually does kind of come across as telling you that withholding belief until you have evidence is the appropriate thing to do, but then we have all those verses about not putting God to the test, which seem to contradict that. Anyway, my main takeaway from that story is that asking Christians for an on-the-spot demonstration of God's existence is a valid course of action, and if God fails to perform, mocking them by asking whether God's just too busy taking a shit to perform right now is a valid response. But it's important to note that science and God aren't opposed to each other. There are some renowned scientists who believed in God, such as Sir Isaac Newton, Johannes Kepler, and Francis Bacon. That's nice. Also, the guy who proposed the Big Bang was a priest. But you probably want to stay away from that one on account of the whole young earth creationism thing, right? 
But yeah, picking out a handful of scientists who were religious from a time period when not being religious got you ostracized from society is not exactly a convincing argument for God's existence. In fact, many of these believing scientists used God as their motivation for their scientific contributions. Sure, in a time when the church controlled education, figuring out how nature worked was seen as a pursuit of understanding God's creation. You're supposed to be providing evidence for God's existence here, though, not arguing from popularity. It's also important to note that science can't solve all of life's questions. People can make claims like, you can't prove Christianity scientifically, so it can't be true. No, that's right, you can't prove Christianity scientifically. But you would be able to if Christianity were actually true. Make of that what you will. But science isn't the only way to prove something's authenticity. Let's take a look at scientific proofs. When you prove something scientifically, you use the scientific method. You make observations, form a hypothesis, and in a controlled environment, you conduct tests and analyze the results to see if your hypothesis was true or not. And then from there, you can either draw a conclusion or conduct more tests. That is an oversimplified explanation of one of the processes that are included in the scientific method, yes. So, for instance, if I observe a Bible verse that says that anyone with faith as small as a mustard seed will be capable of moving mountains. This is a testable claim. There are plenty of people out there with faith in God. And yet the mountains seem relatively stationary. With literally billions of Christians out there, not a single one has had enough faith to move mountains and has thought to try out this superpower? I feel like this would be a regular demonstration of the truth of God on behalf of believers if it actually worked, and you wouldn't need to appeal to argumentation and apologetics instead of doing demonstrable, testable, repeatable things like the Bible says you'd be able to do. You see, a large part of proving something scientifically is conducting tests over and over again and observing their results. Show me the moving mountains that are demonstrably tied to people with faith. Prayer has been tested in other ways as well. In fact, it seems that God likes it when people get pregnant because the most significant positive impact of prayer was on fertility treatments, with half the people being prayed for getting pregnant, as opposed to 26% of the non-prayer group. But God doesn't care much to help you with your heart condition because there was no difference for those groups, and other studies found that knowing you were being prayed for increased your chances of experiencing complications, with there being no significant difference between the groups that were being prayed for or not, and didn't know whether or not they were being prayed for. So the efficacy of prayer is all over the place, with most studies coming back showing no effect. And I'm sure you'll be tempted to pull out the one that showed a positive effect, just as I am tempted to pull out the one that showed a negative effect, but those two are outliers. The most likely explanation here is that there is no effect, and some variable or other was not adequately controlled for in the other two studies. And this method is incredibly useful, but it can't answer all of life's questions. No, but Douglas Adams can. And here's some questions science can't answer. Was George Washington the first president of the United States? The piecing together of historical events is a science. Certainly there are differences between history and other fields of science, but that doesn't make the processes by which we determine which historical events are true, which are false, and which are embellishments a non-scientific process. Was Martin Luther King Jr. a civil rights activist? I mean, once you get to the era where we have actual recordings of the person themselves doing these things, it becomes much easier to demonstrate scientifically that, yes, Martin Luther King Jr. was indeed a civil rights activist. So we've come to cash this check, a check that will give us upon demand the riches of freedom and the security of justice. Did Alexander the Great rule in Greece and was Plato the student of Socrates? And now that we're in ancient history, it does become a bit more difficult as you have to put together details of people's lives as told by other people, many of whom were not all that interested in keeping it factual. This is the category that Jesus fits into. But I'd just like to take a moment to remind you that we're talking about God here. We're not talking about some historical figure who isn't around to question anymore. You want people to have a personal relationship with Jesus Christ himself. Jesus is the person around whom there is much debate as to what he actually said and did, and even whether or not he existed in the first place. But I'm supposed to be able to have a relationship with him. Okay, so if he's still around and I can have a relationship with him, then why can't you just introduce me to him like you admitted at the beginning of the video that you can't? Why do I have to rely on the science of history to piece together what might have happened in order to conclude that he may be what the Bible claims? Why can't he just show up and answer the question once and for all himself? 
You see, when you start asking questions dealing with history, you have to look at the historical proofs where you determine whether the evidence provided is trustworthy. You have to weigh everything that's there. And when we do this, when we examine the Bible through the scientific lens of history, we're left with Maybe there was a guy named Yeshua who pissed off the Romans enough to be crucified in the first century CE, and here's one collection of things that he might have actually said, and here's several more collections of things that we have good evidence that he never said. Sorry, snake handlers, that part is in the one that we have good reasons to believe that he never said. You have to look at the written testimonies, any eyewitness accounts, artifacts, oral testimonies, etc. So, for written testimonies, we have early accounts that talk about Jesus in a way that makes him look like a non-corporeal vision in Paul's writings, then we get the later bare-bones Gospel of Mark, which never even claims to be an eyewitness testimony, then we have Matthew and Luke, which copy word for word very heavily from Mark and so aren't independent sources, and they also don't claim to be eyewitness testimony, with these three together seeing Jesus in a sort of adoptionist light, where he's just a normal guy who God adopts as his son. And then we finish with John, written the latest, with the most exaggerated accounts of Jesus' miracles, and which seem to have been written specifically to counter the adoptionist claims, with John several times going out of his way to say things like bearing his own cross when the other Gospels have him being helped by Simon of Cyrene. It looks like every time the story gets written down, it gets more and more exaggerated with more and more fluff added on. We don't have eyewitness accounts except for Paul, and Paul gives us next to no details about the actual life of Jesus. We have zero artifacts pertaining to Jesus, though I will grant that there are plenty of claimed artifacts. In fact, there are five tombs of Jesus that you can visit in the world. Surprisingly, only three of them are in Jerusalem. The other two are in India and Japan, with the Japanese tomb coming with a legend about how Jesus' brother was the one that died on the cross, while Jesus fled to Japan, settled down as a rice farmer, married a nice young lady, and had kids and lived to a ripe old age of 106. Rice farmer Jesus is canon to me now. For oral testimonies, though, we have nothing. So slim pickings is what we have for Jesus. You can't use the scientific method in determining if Aristotle, Alexander the Great, or if Caesar Augustus existed. Not the scientific method as you laid out, because as I pointed out earlier, history is different from the rest of science. But this all kind of becomes a moot point when you're talking about a modern person that you claim exists today. If you were to tell me that you had a brother named Charlie, and then I said I didn't believe you, you would prove me wrong by introducing me to your brother Charlie. Not by pointing out that I believe that Alexander the Great was a real guy without ever having met him, as the though that makes the current existence of your brother Charlie more or less likely. Why won't you just introduce me to Charlie? You would have to look at all the manuscripts and evidence for their existence. So if you look at Jesus and the Christian movement that followed his resurrection, you have to realize that those events can't be proven scientifically, but they can be proven through records of written testimonies. No, the written records do not prove them any more than the written records prove that Vespasian had miraculous healing powers or that Odysseus really tricked Achilles into revealing himself so that he could take him to the Trojan War. The magical impossible stuff is the stuff that usually gets put aside as likely not historical when studying history, and for good reason. You see, if you look at the person of Jesus of Nazareth, you'd find that he's a unique figure in history with a substantial amount of evidence for his existence. Not really? He didn't preach anything truly revolutionary. The best that you can do for that claim is that he claimed himself to be God. And that claim itself is rather dubious. It doesn't show up until John, with the Jesus and the other Gospels being decidedly more humble than John's Jesus. And given that Jewish leaders of the time had the authority to execute people for the crime of blasphemy, Even if they do say Jehovah! <laughs> This would have provided them with the perfect excuse to kill Jesus, which John also said they were trying to do at this time. So if Jesus had actually claimed that early in his ministry that he was God, then his ministry never would have gotten to the point of the crucifixion. They would have just executed him by stoning shortly after he made that claim. Ergo, he likely wasn't running around making that claim the way that John says he was. See, this is part of that science of history thing. It's not about determining that this book is written so close to the events temporally, therefore it must be accurate. It's about figuring out how likely the book is to be accurate given what it says, the cultural context of when and where it was written, what it doesn't say, how it compares to other similar works, etc. You can't just look at the Gospels as either wholly reliable or wholly unreliable. You have to examine each claim they make individually. And I'm sorry to say it, but it doesn't look good for gospel reliability. Actually, no, I'm not sorry to say that.
There's thousands of manuscripts written about him. The manuscript count for ancient documents only ever seems to be important for the Bible, it seems. What is contained within the manuscripts are more important to me than just how many manuscripts there are. Now, fun fact, there are more scribal errors that we know of in the manuscripts than there are manuscripts total. What does that say about reliability? The truthful answer is probably not much either way, but the fact of the matter is that a scribe copying out a manuscript a thousand years after Jesus lived has zero impact on the accuracy of the manuscript to the event that actually happened. If we're going by manuscript count, we have zero from the first century, and only a handful from the second. We don't start to see the number of manuscripts increase significantly until the Catholic Church gained power and set up scriptoriums with teams of monks whose full-time job was to do nothing but copy manuscripts out. The manuscript count is completely irrelevant when talking about how accurate the manuscripts are to real-world events. And if you can prove the existence of Jesus, then you have to look at who he claimed to be. And he claimed to be God as seen in John 5.18 and John chapter 10 verses 30 to 33. Even if I grant everything up until now, all we're left with is the confirmed existence of a guy who claimed to be God once. There are lots of those out there. Do we have to accept each one at their word now? So what reasons do you have to believe in God's existence? Well, Jesus' existence points to God's existence. Jesus' existence is contested. And if I grant that he existed, then all it does is point to a Jewish apocalyptic preacher having existed at a time when Jewish apocalyptic preachers were a dime a dozen. In order to get to the point where Jesus' existence points to God's existence, I would first have to grant that the Gospels are accurate retelling of events, something for which there is very little evidence, even if I'm generous because of his claim to be God. Because of his claim to be God, the existence of David Koresh is proof of God. As is Wayne Bent, Inri Christo, David Shaler, Marshall Applewhite, Jim Jones, Charles Manson, and more. This is not a good argument, buddy. And the argument is broken down like this. The first premise is that Jesus existed. Which I nearly always grant for argument's sake. The second premise is that Jesus claimed to be God. Which is doubtful, given that the cultural context surrounding these claims would have had him executed the wrong way before he could go and get himself executed the right way, and before a good chunk of his ministry could happen. The third premise is that Jesus proved he was God, whether it was through his miracles, resurrection, or fulfillment of prophecies. Which is incredibly doubtful, as there is zero evidence that the miracles described in the Gospels actually occurred and weren't just stories. Miracles abound in ancient texts. Can you give me a good reason to accept the ones that are in the Bible that doesn't also get us to a point where we are now accepting the ones in other non-biblical books? And if these three premises are correct, then the conclusion naturally follows, which is that God exists. It really doesn't, though. Let's grant hypothetically that miracles are possible. And let's say that there is some unexplained force behind them. Not a god, just a power that can be tapped into. If someone managed to figure out how to tap into that power, would that person not be able to claim that they are God and then use this power to bolster their point without actually being correct in the matter? If we've learned anything from the list of people claiming to be God that I gave earlier, it's that human beings like to have power over other human beings, and will sometimes lie in order to get it. So premise one is questionable, but I grant it because arguing over his existence is just not a topic that interests me. Premise two is also questionable. Premise three, however, I just flat out reject. Before we can accept premise three, you have to first demonstrate that it is impossible for some source of miraculous power to exist without not only being God, but specifically the Christian God. Because I could even grant that miracles could only originate from a God, and then conclude that a non-Christian God was looking to cause some mischief and so granted this Jesus guy miracle powers as a God-tier practical joke. At best, even this argument that specifically involves Jesus can only get you to the concept of a god and doesn't actually tell you anything about that god other than it either is or is not the Christian god. So yeah, doesn't really tell you much. If someone disagrees with the conclusion, then they have to disprove one of the premises just discussed. No, I don't have to disprove it, I just have to explain why I don't accept it. It's on you to explain why your premises are actually true. They could argue against the first premise and claim that Jesus never existed, but there's plenty of manuscript evidence for that. The manuscript evidence is evidence that lots of people copied stories about Jesus, not evidence for Jesus himself. 
And if they reject those manuscripts, then how can we believe in Socrates, Plato, Aristotle, or Alexander the Great since they were based on fewer manuscripts? Would now be a good time to bring up the fact that Alexander the Great claimed that he was a deity and was the son of Zeus? There's a reason we reject these parts of the story as being legendary exaggerations. There's also the fact that we don't just have manuscripts from his side of the story, we have records from the countries that he invaded that talk about the invasion, so we can compare the friendly accounts to the unfriendly accounts and see where they agree and where they disagree. Not so for Jesus. No Roman records of his activities or his execution. No mentions by any unfriendly sources except for the occasional passing mention about something those Christians believe. And then there's also the fact that nobody is trying to convince me to make significant changes to my life, which include giving them money, based on the belief in the existence of Socrates, Plato, Alexander the Great, or Aristotle. If they disagree with the second premise and argue against Jesus' claims to be God, then all you have to do is point to scripture where Jesus claims that he was God, or point to passages that depict Jesus as God. And then you just have to turn to the other passages where Jesus says that he is not God, or where he is depicted as not being God, such as in Mark 10.18, when someone calls him good teacher, and he responds by admonishing him and pointing out that no one is good except for God alone an odd thing for God to say in response to being called good. And let's not forget that in Gethsemane, Jesus did not want to go through with the crucifixion and asked God to stop it from happening. And that passage is notably absent from John's version of the story, seeing as how John wanted Jesus to be fully God, and obviously a little thing like having your human body crucified isn't a problem for God. But it is a problem if you're just a normal human that has been adopted by God. People can make the argument that you can't use the Bible to prove the Bible, but right now all you're doing is establishing the fact that Jesus claimed to be God. A fact that is claimed by the Bible in the Bible and has no external verification outside of the Bible. So even just that one basic fact can't be clearly determined. And we can't even pretend that this is one of the facts that has been verified across the Bible, because biographically speaking, John is the only book that claims to recount the life of Jesus that makes this claim that Jesus is God. For the other books, it is either explicitly contradicted, or when it isn't contradicted, Jesus being God can only be inferred. And on a side note, the New Testament is supported by over 24,000 manuscripts, so it's not an empty argument when you use the Bible. Okay, I guess I'll do this again. I once ran a script that copied Darwin's Origin of Species 30,000 times on my hard drive. It copied it way more reliably than the monks copying the New Testament. In fact, I would be shocked if there was even one single textual variant among all the copies that I had. Does my having run that script make evolution more true now than it was before I ran the script? If not, then I am curious why anyone thinks that monks copying out a book a thousand years after it was written somehow counts as evidence that the contents of that book are true. If they disagree with the third premise, that Jesus proved to be God, you can give them evidence for the resurrection or the fulfillment of prophecy. Well, as to the fulfillment of prophecy, I went into more detail in last Friday's video, but in a nutshell, all of the prophecies are either too vague to actually say that they were about Jesus, or they were specific enough that when you look at them in context, they are very obviously not about Jesus. The New Testament writers had to misquote prophecies in order to make them fit, and we have no evidence to suggest that the events that would have fulfilled the prophecies actually happened in the first place. As to the resurrection, I have seen nothing to convince me that such an event actually took place. As the Gospels don't even claim to be eyewitness accounts, they can just be dismissed as repeating already established stories. And then when we go back to the earlier books in the Gospels, we have one guy who said that he had a vision and a creed that would have been recited by early believers about how many people saw Jesus, but good luck actually verifying any of them yourself. The creed would amount to a believer in alien abductions telling you today that he knows 500 people that had their anuses probed by aliens in flying saucers, but then not giving you any details about who those 500 people actually are. Which are strong reasons to at least consider Jesus' deity. If they could actually be demonstrated to have happened, then yes, they would be strong reason to at least consider it. But as they cannot be demonstrated to have actually happened, then they really aren't good reason for believing anything. Since rising from the dead and the fulfillment of multiple prophecies made hundreds of years prior are both impossible. More likely, since they are both impossible, is that these parts of the story are embellishments, something that is known to happen quite frequently in history. And if these three premises are correct, that Jesus existed, that Jesus claimed to be God, and that Jesus proved to be God, then the conclusion must be true, and that's that God exists. 
I mean, I guess, but the best you could do when defending premise three, that Jesus proved to be God, was to say that the things Jesus did would be a strong reason to at least consider that he might be God. If I grant everything that you've said up to this point, then I have reason to consider that Jesus might be God. Therefore, God, I guess. Sorry, but having reason to consider that a specific person may have been a god does not then take you to the conclusion God totally definitely exists. So to wrap everything up, did I prove that God does in fact exist? No, you did not, which is something that should be easy for any apologist to do simply by introducing us to the guy. No. But I gave a reason why you could believe in God. Okay, but I'm not going to rearrange my life and start giving money to organizations with histories of child abuse because you gave me a reason to consider something without actually doing anything to demonstrate the truth of that something in the first place. And there are others that we will share as we continue in our series. As far as I can tell, this was the last video in the series. Well done. Today's comment of the day comes to us from Remember Me 6 who says, I would like to see you respond to James Tour at some point. Well, that will probably never happen, because my response to James Tour is to just point out that on his website, he comes right out and says that he is not an intelligent design advocate and doesn't even know how intelligent design would go about being tested. He then goes on to basically admit that his whole thing is to point out things that we don't know about abiogenesis. The Discovery Institute loves him because he is willing to angrily shout about how much scientists don't know, and then they can go on to draw creationist conclusions from the fact that we don't know some of the stuff that Tour says we don't know. So basically, to respond specifically to him would amount to me simply pointing out that drawing creationist conclusions from his statements are nothing more than a god of the gaps, as Dr. Tour himself points out on his own website. Why is he willing to be the mouthpiece of an anti-science organization like the Discovery Institute? I don't know, and it makes me sad. But with regards to the creation versus evolution debate, he doesn't say anything other than we don't know, but he says it with big words. Thanks for watching. Special thanks as always to my patrons, Lynn Dobbs, Mark McManus, What Jesus, and all the rest, who are the proof of the God that is my channel. If you'd like to suggest that maybe possibly thinking about the potential existence of a God might be an okay thing to do, you can join us on Patreon for as little as a dollar per week over at patreon.com slash vice rhino. If you feel so inclined, you can also support the channel through direct donation or my Amazon wishlist, which are linked in the description. If you'd like to listen to my videos in podcast form, the link for that is also in the description, as well as links to my social media accounts and my P.O. Box address. See you next time!